Hey guys, welcome back to my channel and welcome to another video. So today's video is not exactly um, a normal type of video, quote unquote a normal type of video, but I certainly believe that we are not exactly in a normal time. Not only are we dealing with a pandemic that has literally killed thousands of people all across the globe, um, affected everyone's life, literally pretty much everyone's life on this planet has been affected or changed in some way. People being forced to work from home or just come off of work work altogether, um, people losing their jobs, people obviously being ill and ended up in hospital and just a range of different things but all in all this has definitely been a time that has affected every single person on this planet's life and then as though that wasn't already enough pressure and just a lot to deal with itself you know having to be in the midst of a pandemic where not only does it affect you physically but it also affects you you know maybe emotionally spiritually if you want to call it that as well um you know sometimes there's a level of paranoia because you're like you know oh am i gonna catch it if i do this am i gonna catch it i don't want to i don't want to get this disease in case it kills me so there's been a lot of heightened emotions and feelings and just a lot going on already. And then to make matters worse, um, then there is now a current uproar and um, an uprising against what some are calling the institution, some are calling racism, fascism, whatever you want to call it. Ultimately, we all know that um, recently there was a video that started to circulate uh, not too long ago. Now, this video was of a black man by the name of George Floyd, aka black man, African-American man, who, again, based um, in America, lives in America, and who was killed by the police, was murdered by the police. And the reason why I'm using the term murder, even though there hasn't necessarily been um, a proper trial done, even though the person um, has, the murderer, has quite literally um, been taken out of their job and they were fired from their job, I call it a murder because if if this was another if this was a video that came up of another citizen another human being doing this to this black man it would be considered murder but because it was a police officer someone who is in a position of authority someone who is supposed to protect and serve the community that they are in and um, because it was them the system because of the way it's been built and um, we can go into a whole ramble about you know sy systemic and systematic oppression and racism and all of that jazz but i'm not even going to go into all of that because we we know what it is we know what it is already yes there's also the argument of not all police officers are like that yes but there's also a system that's been in place that protects police officers that are like that through numerous occasions where police officers have committed atrocity atrocities murders crimes like this and they've just gotten a slap on the wrist and kind of been told oh you're going to be fine or that they'll fire you um but then they probably ended up we, we don't hear about them anymore but they probably ended up going to another state and then working elsewhere and i'm so grateful that i have a platform because i'm not gonna lie i've said it to you guys before my youtube channel feels like therapy to me sometimes and i have to be able to just get things out and share so that we all can have a point you know i can use my platform as a point of conversation but ultimately this is why a lot of people including myself do not like the term bame or people of color anyone that knows me knows that anytime i've ever been on a live i've been um, at an event i've spoken on a an, on a stage anytime i ever have to use that term because of the context of the conversation i always say i'm so sorry guys i hate this term or i always put quotation marks purely because of things like this when you are lumped in with a group of people it almost makes it seem as though your experience with those other people is the same i.e when you say bame black and minority ethnic groups and you lump us together you then put people like that are from china or people from korea you also put them um, in with mexicans and latinas or, or latinos you also put them in with asians and indians whereas our experience and again people of color would does the same thing whereas our experience as black individuals individuals forget anything else i'm just talking about black individuals right now because of the context of this video black individuals is very very different and it's almost as though people expect um there to be a level of unity because we have a maybe slight shared experience i.e for most people who are latinos or latinas or asian or whatever um have experienced some form of prejudice or racism in some context whether it be historically whether it be themselves whether it be they experience it you know with their own parents or even with themselves as individuals because of that shared experience all black and minority ethnic groups get lumped in together. But the issue with that is, is that 
as as individual groups we have very very different experiences and this is what a lot of people were even angry about you know when i saw the video and i saw this man this um again i don't know where he's from i'm just assuming that he's chinese or korean or you know i'm not 100 percent sure but this asian man basically standing by and not doing anything it's another reminder uh, basically another kick in the face to kind of say you cannot expect people that you are lumped into a group with to protect you or to stand for you because there is still a difference and a division between these groups not that i encourage division between people not that i'm saying that you know we should be divided but just that i'm saying that oftentimes you will still see a black man as a black man and an Asian man as an Asian man. Two very different and separate groups of people. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. And Jay Alexander Kuang uh, participated in Floyd's arrest with Kuang holding Floyd's back, um, Lane holding his legs and Tao looking on as he stood nearby. So definitely Tao was the one that, that looked either Chinese or like, you know. Sorry guys, so my battery basically died. I know I should have come more prepared and charged up all my stuff before obviously getting here. Um, but yeah, at the time I just wasn't even thinking about it. Don't know why I could have charged it while I was getting ready, all that jazz. But if you see that the camera's moved a bit, I do apologize. Um, and I'm trying to remember where I last left off, but I know that I was ultimately reading about the death of George Floyd, which sparked all the stuff that we're seeing now from the protests, the riots, etc. Um, and just to um, give you guys a bit more information about it, just in case you're not 100% sure why this has even started or why people are even protesting. So the incident was recorded on smartphones and the arrest was made after Floyd allegedly attempted to use a $20 bill in a deli, which an employee identified as counterfeit. Police stated that Floyd physically resisted after being ordered to, to exit his vehicle before the video was filmed. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff, you know, I will leave the link in the description box below. So if you you want to check it out you want to read more about this case please feel free to do that but i think it's really important for you to to read this kind of stuff in order for for you me us to understand why we are fighting for what we're fighting and i'm going to be explaining a little bit more about that in a second as well but i actually found a bit where there's been a bit of an update about charges that are happening and what's kind of happening moving forward so charges which is something that i actually didn't know this is the first time that i'm hearing about this because from what i have understood so far was that you know um basically that the officer had been fired from his job but was actually not formally charged and would not actually go down for murder that's where i was last at but also and again i'm going to go back to it in a second but that is also me having taken a couple of days to kind of take a step back purely because i felt as though um I'm a very, very emotional person and I get very emotionally invested in things and I start to overthink, I start to question everything, I start to build up a lot of emotion inside of me which could lead to a place of rage, anger and just frustration. And it's not healthy if you are constantly, consistently feeling like that. So I chose to take a step back from social media after reading the various things that I was reading. There was just too much going on and a lot of noise and I just had to take a step back before I could even film a video like this. Um, but again, I'm gonna explain that in a second. I just wanna read this. So charges, um, Chauvin or Chauvin, however you pronounce the name, was arrested on May the 29th and Hennepin County attorney Mike Freeman charged him with third degree murder and second degree manslaughter. He also said he anticipated charges for the three other officers. Under Minnesota law, third degree murder is defined as causing another's death without intent to kill, but evincing a depraved mind without regard for human life. Uh, so I'm just looking at the definition as well, right? So the definition of um, evincing a depraved mind without regard for human life, it says in the United States law, depraved heart murder, also known as depraved indifference murder, is a type of murder where an individual acts with a depraved indifference to human life and where such act results in a death despite that individual not explicitly intending to kill so it kind of sounds like the person treated the person unhumanly and used excessive force as was was seen in the video but didn't have the intention to kill now whether he did or didn't have the intention we will never know because that's between him and god no one will ever know if he had the intention to kill but the point is is that he did he murdered somebody so um uh blah 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 second degree manslaughter also does not imply lethal intent but that the perpetrator created an unreasonable risk of serious harm or death Benjamin Crump, the lawyer of Floyd's family, called for the first degree charge for Chauvin, which requires an intent to kill. 
um, I just wanted to kind of read that just so in case people don't know, like there's been an update because I didn't actually know that until reading this. Also, there's an autopsy that's going to happen. So an official autopsy found no indication that Floyd died of strangulation or traumatic asphyxia, rather that he likely died of the combined effects of being restrained, underlying health conditions, including coronary artery disease and hypertensive heart disease and potential intoxicants. In his, in his system, Floyd's family retained Michael Baden, a pathologist and a former New York City chief medical examiner who has also conducted a second autopsy on Eric Garner to perform an independent examination in this case. I, thought, I felt like that was really important to read as well just because, you know, we know throughout history that there have been numerous times whereby data, information, analytics, whatever you want to call it, has been tampered with and where things have been covered up by police departments, police sheriffs. Um, I'm someone that's really into crime, true crime stories. Anyone that knows me, any of my family, uh, you know, in fact, my family don't even think I'm weird because we are a family that love to do research. We love um, understanding crimes, understanding why certain crimes happen. So we actually have talks all the time and we, we share podcasts and stuff that we listen to. One of my favorites, is one called morbid morbid a true crimes podcast you can check it out and link it in the description box below um where we it basically follows crimes and one of the 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 one of the common things that actually comes up in a lot of these issues and crimes is that you always hear about this police department in whatever state covered up this crime or they didn't use the right means of action in order to investigate thoroughly or they ignored the signs or whatever it is and so i hear this repetitively all the time and we know that data analytics etc can be manipulated however you want it to be manipulated so i'm actually so glad that they're getting an independent examination because it's so easy when there's a lot of pressure coming at you because people are protesting it's so easy to try and rush through a process um, have an examination and either one of two things might happen one the process is so rushed that things get missed or two that you just decide to rush the process and just try to come to a conclusion in order to try and de um de-escalate de the situation and sometimes a conclusion that might be fake it might be wrong it might be um d deceived it could be you know just a, a conclusion basically that is not necessarily true so i'm so glad that they're going in for an independent examination i feel like that's really really important um but yeah anyway the only reason i wanted to delve into that a little bit more is just because i know how easy it is to hear so many different things and hear so many things going on you're kind of like what even happened um you know a lot of outrage a lot of anger a lot of desperation has kind of erupted from this and some people might not even know how this happened what happened and who they should sort of believe obviously the internet again can be manipulated by people but i just wanted to share that in order to kind of anyone that's trying to make sense of the situation understand where this all started that's basically where it started from now when obviously hearing about this and hearing and I could well, let me be honest I didn't even and I haven't till now been able to even watch the full video because it is the most traumatizing and heartbreaking thing to watch somebody that looks like you so whether he is african-american or he's living in whatever part of the world there is a deeper level of pain and hurt when you witness somebody that shares the same skin color as you someone that if you put it in if you took him out of um, african you know out of america being african-american really and truly that could be my brother my cousin my sibling whatever it is and when you start looking at it like that there's such a level of pain and anger and frustration especially then when you consider the history now I'm not gonna go into a whole massive history lesson not the case the, the fact is nor do I even know everything about African-American history about what African-American people are feeling right now I'm not trying to claim that at all but all I am saying is that we know the long-standing history even before anything else like we know the long-standing history um, from things like slavery and you guys know I always talk about the fact that you know our history didn't start at slavery nor did it end nor should it end but I'm just using it for this context to kind of talk about why people are so mad and why people are so angry and frustrated from anything from slavery to you know blatant racism to then covert racism to then um, systemic and institutional differences and between groups of people i mean even during corona and covid19 we saw disparity between people who come again from that bame group which black people will probably be even bi a bigger disparity 
bigger disparity but we see we even saw that even with COVID-19 that black people were more likely to die from corona some articles were saying four times more likely some were saying three times more likely and I spoke about this in an interview that I did on my channel actually and I'll link it again in the description box below so you can check it out with a doctor a black female doctor and we spoke about this the fact that there is such a disparity now the number that people kind of agree on is about near enough two percent two times more likely to die to, not two percent sorry two times more likely to die from corona as a black or someone from you know ethnic minor, minority group and if we're seeing these differences and these gaps these differences and these gaps even in the healthcare system and then on top of that you even think and i'm going to google it actually now how much more likely is a black person to be stopped and searched in the UK. Let's have a look. This is insane. According to an article by The Guardian in 2019, it says black people in England and Wales are 40 times more likely than white people to be stopped and searched under controversial powers, etc., and the laws, etc. 40 times more likely. So when you start looking at all of these in, um, differences and then you hear about the experiences that people have, I mean, I have friends who have told me stories about their brothers. Literally, I have one particular friend, I will never forget this story because it broke my heart. You know, talking about the fact that her brother was literally picked up. He was, I think he was just walking on the street or whatever, picked up by the police, beaten up, thrown to the back of a police van because someone had reported that a black man in the area was trying to, I think, break into someone's house or something like that. So they saw him, saw that he was a black guy, took him, put him in the back of a police van, beat him up, and then left him in the middle of nowhere. And he had to find his way home. This is a story that someone extremely close to me who I know is a credible source, this is not somebody that I would just be like, mm, yeah, they like to exaggerate situations. They have absolutely no reason to exaggerate a story or a situation like that. And this was just in a discussion that we were having in private. So there was no need for them to exaggerate that scenario, that situation. But them saying that this happened, so you need to understand, and a lot of people need to understand that, you know, this is, there's a right, there's a rightful anger. People have the right, there's a righteous anger. Like people have, the right to be mad and to be angry because this is not just this is not something new i mean even a lot of people were um were aligning it or likening it sorry people were likening it to the death of eric garner back in 2014 from what i can remember back in 2014 who was repeating the same thing i can't breathe i can't breathe and who later on ended up dying um as a result of again i haven't done the, the depth of research but i'm assuming because of the arrests and you know the injuries that he sustained from that arrest so people are mad people are frustrated and people are angry so for me personally when i was seeing all of this stuff it erupted such a level of anger in the inside of me that i cannot lie it started turning into rage and overthinking now when i knew and this is why it's so important i always talk to you guys about being very self-aware and making sure you take the time to understand how you are because i know myself i know that i'm a very emotional person and sometimes i can do things um, out of my emotion i can be emotionally charged and i react emotionally rather than taking a step back and actually thinking what makes sense what makes impact what makes a difference so for me after seeing all this stuff reading all this stuff being bombarded with all of this information which can be very traumatic by the way bearing in mind that this is you know black people having to relive these traumas from the past and a lot of people might be like oh um well you, things like for example slavery why would it be traumatic to you if you know that it happened 500 years ago 400 years ago and at the end of the day people are not slaves anymore because you still see the remnants and you still see the um the issues and the separation between black and let's just say white for example and that's why it's still traumatic because you know that it comes from a place of a, a, a bigger place it's not just an isolated experience whereby oh this one person ended up getting in a scuffle with the police officer and they happened to kill them no when you are literally being told to relive this experience over and over again it's very traumatic yes slavery might have happened and been abolished and all that kind of stuff but there are still remnants of it there's still remnants of prejudice and fascism and and all the things the isms that you want to bring up there are still remnants of it till this day i mean the stats the data and the statistics are there 
So for me, there was a lot of conflicting thoughts because I actually mentioned on Twitter and I was saying how I've actually been in a place where I have definitely been considering my political standpoint a lot more. So I was very, very left and I, I, I always thought that I would be very, very left for a very long time. I was very left, very, um, you know, if you're in the States, that's more Democrats. Um, you know, if you're in the UK, more Labour, wherever you are, just more left, right? Um, but as the years have kind of gone by and as I've been exposed to different environments and, and different um, people and having different conversations with different types of people, I'm actually realizing more and more that I'm leaning further away from the left that I used to. So this for me was like even more of a weight because over the past few weeks, literally even two days before this situation happened with George before this happened with George Floyd, um, I was literally watching debate after debate after debate, trying to get a better understanding of both sides of the spectrum when it comes to politics in America. Just because while a lot of people might say, oh, that's America, this is the UK, two very separate places. Listen, America is the leading, basically the leading power of the world. And if you don't understand the politics that's going there, you don't understand the things that are trickling within your own communities and within your, your own space, no matter where you live, purely because they are so powerful and there are, they are basically the face of the nations, right? That's how I kind of see America. So for me, it was very important for me to start looking at both sides of the spectrum. So I was looking at debates and conversations that people from the right were having, people on the left were having. And then this came about and I was just like, yo, it, it, it was like a slap in the face. And it felt like I literally felt like I was going to explode. I felt like I was going on overload. I was overthinking everything guys honestly everything everything down to the fact that i even made a tweet where i felt i even at one point felt like it's actually all just a big trap because i felt as though you know on the one side you know if people protest and riot etc things start being set alight people then can use that to twist the narrative and skew the narrative and make it seem as though the black people or the people that are protesting are the problem and then it takes away from the actual issue at hand. The actual issue at hand is that America especially has had an issue with racism, institutional, systemic, systematic racism for a really, really long time. And it takes away from that. And it almost feels as though that's what they want. Now, we like to use the word they a lot. And I'll let you put in whatever context of they that you think. Some people apply they to the system. Some people um, apply they to the powers that be. Some people apply they to um, uh, uh, those in government or those in politics. They can be whatever you want it to be. But ultimately, I'm just using they as a way of, um, I would say, in my opinion, those that basically hold power and those that actually, um, the, the, the powers that be, I would, I would label it as the powers that be, right? So the powers that be that control the media, that control the narrative, that control a lot of what we see and that we think is formulated by our own opinion. My mind was like, if we go onto the, onto the other side where people riot and protest, it allows people to skew the narrative. But then at the same time, even if you do decide to do the complete opposite, which might not necessarily be to write and protest, which for some people it could be, okay, rather than writing, writing and protesting, I'm just gonna make sure that I become economically dominant in this world in some way. Now, the reason why I mentioned that, and I'm gonna actually come back to some of the solutions that I truly do believe that that I truly do believe that we should be trying to move towards in order for all of this, all of this anger, upset, frustration to mean something. Because one thing that I knew that I wanted to talk about in this video, as you can tell by the title of this video, solutions. I didn't want to just come here and spew a whole load of anger and frustration coming from a place of emotion. Hence why I took time to take a step back and to really assess where I was at and where my heart was at. Because I knew if I made this video a couple of days ago, I'm telling you right now, you guys would even be questioning who I was because the level of rage and anger that I was feeling was not healthy. And, you know, my main thing was be angry, be upset, absolutely fine. And you don't get to tell anybody, just like me, I don't get to tell anybody how to be upset. And that's one thing that even I, and I don't even know if I'm going to, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought, but... That's one thing that even I had to have a conversation with myself about because I was kind of like, you know, writing and setting things alight is not the right way of doing it. But at the same time, I then had to take a step back and say, who am I to tell people how to be angry? Who am I to tell people who literally live in the United States of America or who live in certain parts of the world how to be mad? Like, 
Who am I to do that? If people feel as though they've, they've, they've been pushed, because it's like, you know, the, the saying, when you poke a bear, you can only poke a bear so many times before the bear bites back. You cannot expect to poke people and knock people down. And every time they attempt to make something of themselves, you drag them down, you assassinate them, you kill them, you know, you murder them. You cannot expect, you know, to keep poking people and poking people and poking people and not expect a retaliation so you know while i was in one place a couple of days ago and i went on my insta story and i remember kind of saying you know i don't see i don't see what the point is of especially looting now people have their own opinion of looting i don't believe in stealing we should not be stealing this not should this should not be a time where people feel like they should get they should gain something in the midst of a tragedy and the fact that someone was murdered right this should not be an opportunity for you to think do you know what I'm gonna go and do today? While everyone's writing and stuff, I'm gonna go and steal a TV. But what it does do at the same time, and again, this is a conversation I had to have with myself, so you guys can, you guys are basically seeing how my brain has been functioning the past few days, right? But what it does do is that it highlights the fact that people, the only reason that people loot and steal is, is oftentimes because people are desperate. People do it out of a place of desperation. So for people to go out in the middle of a riot, in the middle of whatever, and loot places like Target and whatever. Now I'm not, and I'm gonna say it again, I am not saying that it is right, but I'm trying to get into the psychology of it and understanding that people are desperate. So if they see any opportunity to make some form of gain, they are going to take that. Again, does not mean that I'm dismissing or condoning that behavior. I'm just trying to understand. That's purely it. So that was my brain. At first I was like, it's dumb, it's stupid, it makes no sense. But then I was like, wait a minute, these are people that are probably in very dire and desperate situations. These are people who literally feel like, do you know what, if, if for a very long time I've been here suffering, especially with this whole corona stuff and COVID-19 where some people probably felt really cheated out of their jobs, for example, being just let go out of their jobs or whatever, some people might be like, do you know what, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna gain something, let it be now. You know, so I really had to process and be like, listen, I have no right to tell people how to be angry. What I can say though, is that we definitely need to think twice about the reasons behind and the intentions behind some of the things that is happening. The looting, the, um, you know, the, um, yeah, the looting mainly. Main, it's just the looting aspect that was a bit of a conflict for me. And it still is, and I still don't agree with it. I don't think it's right, but I understand where people are coming from. It shows that there's, there's it shows that there's a lack People only still if there was a lack. If people were living in conditions where, you know, they were fine, i.e. they had their TV, they had their whatever they needed, they probably wouldn't do that, you know, just because there, there's no need. There wouldn't, someone wouldn't feel the need or the urge to do it because it's like, I've got a TV or I've got this or I'm, I'm living in this particular type of way. So you have to always think to yourself, like, where does, where, where why would someone go and do that? Why would people loot? A lot of the time out of desperation, not to make an excuse, but just to understand. Now, Moving forward, because I know that I've been I've been talking for ages and I know that if I don't, you know, make it make sense, I'll be talking forever and I just won't stop. Moving forward, I then went into a place where it was kind of like, okay, I felt angry, I felt frustrated. I took a step back from social media for a couple of days. It was about two days where I didn't really post anything. I didn't really, I even deleted Twitter from my phone because Twitter was, oh child, Twitter was a whole nother thing. I deleted Twitter from my phone, I took a step back um just yeah wasn't really paying attention to social media and after i'd had a chance to actually think all that kept coming up in my heart in my spirit was solutions 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 that was it because i feel as though outrage and upset and frustration only can last for so long there will come a point where in about two weeks time and i can guarantee this guarantee in about two to three weeks time these same people that were spoken about or are being spoken about today these same protests that are happening these same people that are upset or posting things on social media which that is even another topic in itself there was a part of me that also felt as though social media a lot of people which to be fair it still adds to the conversation because if you're posting and you're flooding the timeline you're flooding social media with um you know black lives matter and all of these different things you're bringing attention to it which does help at the end of the day but i felt as though there was a little part of me that questions people's intention and motives um mainly just because i feel as though it was one of two things either some people might have done it or or, or posted out of obligation rather than kind of like what i said before out from a place of duress rather than a place of I really want to be a part of this because I understand that these people's lives are under th are, are under threat every single day. These people's lives 
matter. So I want to be a part of this. I feel like a lot of people did it purely because they didn't want anyone to call them out for not saying anything. And again, is that the right way to go about it? I don't know. Um, until we can have a genuine interest in human beings as a whole, okay, in the life and the pr protection of the human of of other other someone else's life and in this context we're specifically speaking about the lives of black people until we can all have a mutual interest in the protection and in the the just the the, the fact that a black individual should be allowed to live you know even if they have committed a crime that's why we have democracies that's why we have systems in place right that's what that's what's always argued by them the powers that be we have democracy because you're supposed to go through a process if you commit a crime which by the way guys using a counterfeit 20 dollar bill again it's wrong is do you know what i mean I, I don't really know where it comes under in terms of crimes or whatever in america but it is definitely wrong but george floyd just like anybody else who's caught in a crime has every right to go through the judicial process and the judicial judicial system in order to be tried and to be prosecuted correctly but then even if you see that you then go into other bits where you're like well even if he did end up in in the in the um police system or whatever we know that there is such a a targeting on black lives and black individuals especially black men that even if he did go through the judicial system properly he probably would have ended up getting a longer sentence than most or maybe he maybe his white counterpart because of the the way in which the prejudice that lies within that system. So we always hear stories about young men and young women who have done non-violent crimes and who are doing longer, t serving longer sentences in America and probably even the UK actually, because we don't really talk about it in the UK too much, but I would definitely say in the UK also that are doing longer sentences than other people who might have got a slap on the wrist for doing worse. And that's where the issue comes in and that's where the the, the problems begin, you know? And I know I'm just regurgitating a lot of stuff that people know anyway, but I'm just expressing, okay? Now, um, he has the right to live. And until we can get to a place where we all, every single person on this planet, actually is concerned about the right for black people just to live. Nobody's even asking for anything crazy. I don't even think people are even asking for anything crazy anymore. People are just asking that we have the right to live, to breathe, to exist, so that we can be there for our children. I mean, I was reading um, uh, um, uh, articles and stuff that were saying he's left behind two children. Now those two children are gonna be another bunch of kids who don't have a father, especially a black father, who, again, in America, because I was doing a lot of research about this, one of the easiest ways that the black people have been destroyed in America, across the globe, in fact, is to remove the black father from the household. Um, you know, there were statistics that even Obama himself was, was spewing out, something like that. I, I can't remember exactly what the stats are, but, you know, there's a certain, uh, uh, your, your likelihood to be incarcerated or to put in prison or to drop out of school rises when you do not have a father, significantly in this context, a black father in the household. Um, apparently single motherhood has used to be something around the 20% mark in the United States of America and it's now like at 70% or something crazy like that. You know, there's all these different things that are happening around us. <sighs> yeah, guys, I think you can clearly tell where my mind has kind of been at and I think I'm probably one of many people who have been in the place of real just frustration and anger and upset because of the various things that are going on but let me bring it back to what this video is actually supposed to be about right it's actually supposed to be about solutions what do we do move moving forward because it's easy to be mad it's easy to be angry it's easy to be reactive you react you react you react but as i was saying in about two weeks time will people keep the same energy even myself i even had to ask myself because there was a level of guilt that I'm not gonna lie I experienced where I was like even if I post on my Instagram not that it doesn't do anything but that I post on my Instagram or a hashtag on Twitter in two weeks time will I go back to doing exactly the ex basically going to live my life and almost feeling as though oh this you know this doesn't really matter or or not even that it doesn't matter but that I forget because I'm living my own life I forget what's happening and then in about two weeks time we all forget what's going on and we forget that just two weeks ago we were feeling angry upset and frustrated 
something and we were enraged and that's why we reacted at the time rather than actually putting plans and strategies in place so that we can ensure that you know we don't just go back to normal and then all of a sudden that's Everything that we were fighting for a couple of weeks back means nothing. There's always space for online activism. There's always space for people to bring certain topics and certain issues to the surface, 100%. But my thing is, is that will we then protest across the street, um, you know, protesting across the streets, and then in two weeks time, we go back living our lives and nothing actually changes. And then in another four years, when God forbid, but there's another issue like this, because we didn't actually think of the long term, we just thought of the immediate aspect, rather than thinking of the long term, this keeps happening over and over again because I'm not I'm not gonna lie I don't want my kids to grow up in a world where they still have to be protesting the very same issues that we were protesting in 2020 I want my kids to grow up in a world where they understand oh my gosh we've really come very very far and some people might argue we have come far we've come far from slavery and and um, apartheid and even place like you know um, South Africa and and uh, you know um, countries gaining independence 50 so 50 or 60 or so years ago in in part in across Africa we have definitely come a long way but still there is still a very long way for us to go so what are some of the solutions and I actually asked a whole bunch of people to send over petitions and um, uh, funds where people can donate etc and what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be listing all of them underneath this video I'm gonna literally be linking in um, them um, underneath and there's actually a website which someone actually sent to me which I think was the most helpful thing there was a website that um what do you call it that basically collected all of like the places where people can donate all the petitions issues etc are all in one place and people can literally you can spend like an hour of your day and just sit there and sign every petition that's on there you can donate where you want to you can spread as many messages as, as possible but i felt as though it was so important because that's what i was thinking to myself i was like it's all well and good people being upset angry frustrated etc but if we we lose impact when there are pockets of individual things happening in separate places, there is power in numbers. So how do we how do we effectively gather in numbers to actually make a statement? Because that's what it is. That's what this time is right now, making a statement. So there is a link. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to find it because so many of you guys DM'd me, sent me links to different things. Oh, actually, I did. Yeah. Um, it's called www.blacklivesmatter.card, spelled with a double R, dot co. And it literally is, like, it goes through, I don't know if you guys can even see that, but it goes through the different things. So sign the petitions, text or call, donate, more resources for protesters. And it even has a section in here that was like, educate yourself, reverse racism is a myth, um, black mental health resources. There's so much on here. I don't know who the hell created this, but shout out to you. Because I sat there thinking... We need unity and we need it to make sense. Um, what I'm also going to be doing is also linking in the description box below any of the protests, etc., that are going to be happening. Now, some people agree with protests, some people don't. You get to choose what you're going to do with that information, but I feel as though if we are going to gather, let's gather in numbers. Um, you know, kind of moving it, because I've spoken a lot about the US, but moving it over to the UK as well and why this is also just as important to the UK also. And for us to be very, very solution-led, which I've then compiled as well a list of six things that I truly do believe are long-term solutions that we could do in order to ensure that this is not just something that we do now when we get upset and then we go back living our lives and nothing changes and then we keep getting mad when stuff like this happens. Um, and one thing that I just want to clarify as well, and I, I should have said this right at the beginning of the video, is that, listen, I am one individual, one person with one brain and one capacity. Um, I don't know everything. I don't claim to know everything. I don't claim to have all of the answers. In fact, for a very long time, I even did an interview with Premier Gospel um, literally the day after this stuff was happening. Um, um, and I was asked, like, what do we do, especially as, because Premier Gospel is a Christian station, especially as Christians, what do we do? And I literally went round and round in circles and I ended it with, I don't know. Because I think some people try to act as though they know the solutions. And really and truly, this is... A very very small drop in a very big pond of people that are doing some amazing things something else I'm gonna do as well underneath the video is I'm gonna tag all the various pages and people who are very solution led who are very strategy led not just spewing out hate and hatred um, because I feel like there's a lot of that already in the world again you don't have to agree with me you can say you know but I've 
you know, I hate this group of people or whatever. I'm not about that. I'm not about us spewing out even more hatred than there is in the world. I'm about mobilizing and us doing things that will actually advance um, black people, which as a result will advance the rest of the world and will advance the world as a whole. But we have to start it right with our community first, only because of... I don't even have to explain myself. I'm gonna read out some of mine, but before I even go into that, I've spoken a lot about the States and I wanted to speak a little bit about why this is even relevant in the UK as well. So more recently, um, people might have, people might be like, oh, like it's not that big of a, of a problem or an issue in um, the, what do you call it, in the UK, etc. And there was, there's actually been so much on Twitter that has been so helpful to actually understand that this is not just a US thing. This is a global issue, it's a people issue, okay? Um, and there was a thread made by someone by the name of Corinne Skye, who from her profile, she is um, a DJ and an entrepreneur. And she actually did a list, right? A list of black people who have died in police custody um, or who have literally been neglected by our judicial system, who have been neglected from receiving the justice that they deserve. And the list is insane, okay? So just in case you are sitting there thinking, this is an American, an African-American issue. Let's look at ourselves as well. Living in the United Kingdom, we know that institutional racism exists. I mean, even overt racism very, very much exists. So how can we think that if, if there are people who till this day will say things to your face, what makes you think that the institutions that, that govern our society in the UK are not also racist as well? And that there are things that need to be dismantled and that need to be reconstructed or at least dismantled completely and built from scratch because there are serious issues and I'm again I'm gonna address how to kind of do that in a second as well so the list that she compiled is insane so we have number one Sarah Reed was found dead in her cell in Holloway prison North London she was sexually assaulted while being held under the Mental Health Act and was beaten up by police officers and what she's done as well she linked an article which actually let me read this BBC News article politic police brutality Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. Oh wow. Okay. So there's a video. I'm going to leave the link in the description box below. Ooh, guys, yo, this is a lot. This is a lot. This is a lot. So Sarah Reed, 32, was found dead in her cell at Holloway Prison, North London, on the 11th of January. She has been on remand for wound, for wounding with intent charge. Metro Metropolitan Police Officer James Kiddy was found guilty of common assault in 2014 following an attack on Miss Reed during a 2012 shoplifting allegation. Now, there's a video, guys, of a police officer this woman sat down on a chair after being arrested and literally guys the video shows the police officer grabbing her and pretty much like beating her up um wow he was sentenced guys even though the cctv pc james kitty 45 was caught on cctv grabbing miss reed by the head and then punching her as she lay on the floor of Uniqlo so I think she was shoplifting whatever at the time and he did this in the store right miss Reed he was sentenced to a 150 hour community order for common assault now this is why by the way she then later on died in police custody yeah she later on passed away in the prison this is why people get frustrated and say there has to be something wrong if police officers act on like unlawfully unreasonably without even making sense and yet they don't get tried or charged the way that a person on the street like a common person on the street would they get a slap on the wrist because guess what these institutions are created like gangs right a lot of people um don't like it when people refer to the police as gangs but it's true they come together let's even look I even watched a video of um, the gang of police officers who were standing outside the home of the police officer who um, basically who murdered George um, George Floyd, who was standing outside his home. It was an army of them, a gang of them, basically protecting him because they knew that people were angry, people were mad. Now, do I st do I believe that you know um, people should have got their hands on him and killed him? Absolutely not. Do I believe that people should have got their hands on him and beaten him up? Not absolutely not because that's 
one thing that again because of emotion and anger you then are led to become just as bad as the perpetrator and that's never and that should never be the call for justice i at least that's what i personally believe people can disagree with me i mean people often say an eye for an eye and that if he murders somebody he should be murdered also do you know what if you believe that absolutely not but if we're really trying to get justice as we like to say i do not believe that you know um, because this happened then people should rush into his home and murder him in cold in cold blood that's not what it is because i truly do believe them we have just we've basically just become as bad as them there needs to be some distinction between us and them because ultimately if not then i don't really know what happens to the rest of humanity really and truly so but this is the issue when you then have people like this and he served 150 hours that's not even like what is that that's not even it like it's insane but sarah reed was one of them then the next one on here um sheku boye he was detained handcuffed pepper sprayed and put in leg restraints none of the nine police officers who were responsible for sheku's death had charges brought against them mark duggan which was probably the biggest outcry in london that led to protests riots etc but mark duggan was shot dead in tottenham by police an inquest into his death cleared police officers of wrongdoing now with mark duggan from what i can remember because i did a lot of research on him um from what i can remember there was even um uh, uh cover-ups that were spoken about and that were identified saying that um you know he never even had a gun like, even though he never had a gun that they planted a gun near him to try and make it seem like he was shooting at the police and that they shot out of self-defense like these things are real life yo and mark duggan's family never get to see their son again because people just don't because people feel as though and i honestly do believe it's this that people feel as though that they can treat people anyhow and literally treat black people like animals kill us like it's nothing and then because they get away with it and because they're protected by the very people that should be protecting us as a whole they go on to repeat the same thing um i'm going to give you guys a couple more terrell jones burton he was critically injured injured after police pushed him off his bike causing him to have an injury to his brain after being profiled by police officers leon briggs died after being held in custody by police the crown prosecutor chose not to prosecute the six police officers involved in his death Rashawn Charles. He was chased and held down by police officers until he died. The police officer was not charged for his death and it was ruled as accidental despite this young man losing his life. Edson De Castro, De, De Costa. I think this one even is the one that like completely, I, I remember this one so vividly and broke my heart. He was a young father who died shortly after being um, in being put in police, police custody. Although little was known about his death report, state he was restrained and put face down. Police again were not charged nor held accountable for his death actually it's not him there was somebody else and i'm just gonna google it um um right this is the one that broke my heart like this one this is there's a different type of level of injustice right i don't know if you guys remember back in 2017 there was an article about a guy by the name of julian cole i just had to google it so i can get my information right julian cole suffered a um, suffered a severed spinal cord after being arrested on a night out in bedford in 2013 but cps failed to find evidence against officers involved guys long story short with this article i don't even have to read it because i know the story like inside out because it was him that i was doing research on he was he was um um left in a vegetative state i don't even know if he's still alive right now i don't really know if it, i don't even know if he's alive but after being arrested and after his spinal cord was severed his spinal cord do you know the amount of force that you have to apply on somebody for their spinal cord to be severed right after that happened guys he was quite literally left in a vegetative vegetative state he couldn't talk he couldn't feed himself he couldn't do anything vegetative guys because of his contact with the police do you know the level and i remember seeing the pictures of him lying in the hospital bed and it broke my heart and do you know the crazy thing is these are just the ones that we see or we hear about in the news what about the many that we don't even see that we don't even get to understand that we don't even see coming up on the news or whatever um and then and then of course the most recent one which breaks my heart because this woman was a congolese woman and there's something different when it comes to your own community like there's a level of of pain that you feel when it's your own community because you think that literally could have been my mom and um as somebody who like my mom is high risk so I, I, I don't even know it breaks my heart but belly mujinga so this actually happened let's actually look at when this happened 
She was a railway worker, by the way. She was a key member of staff, right? Police closed case of rail workers' COVID-19 death after spitting incident. British Transport Police say no evidence to substantiate offence against Belly. So, no further action will be taken in relation to the death of a railway ticket officer worker who contracted COVID-19 after being spat out while on duty. The British Transport Police have said, um, have said, Benny Majinga, 47, fell ill with the virus days after a man who said he had COVID-19. So he himself stated that he had corona and spat at her and coughed at her and a colleague at Victoria Station. She died on the 5th of April. She's got a daughter who she's left behind. She's got family and friends who she's left behind. And the, apparently the BTB, so the British Transport Police, said detectives had conducted extensive inquiries, which including reviewing CCTV footage of the incident and speaking to witnesses. Um, Majinga's, death, Majinga's death sparked a national outcry and a call for more protection for transport workers. Boris Johnson condemning the incident. The fact that she was abused for doing her job is utterly appalling. Not only that, but I'm so sorry. Why is there not a call to take a, a murderer? That is murder. That is actual murder. You do realize that, right? When you have somebody that is ill with an illness and a sickness and a disease, and they even say the, the audacity of it to even look at somebody in the eye and say, yeah, ha ha, I have, co well, obviously I don't know how that's went, but you basically are rubbing it in their face. I have corona and I'm going to spit and cough on you. That person died as a result of that. That is murder. And whether it be manslaughter or they intend to do it or not, and we go into the semantics and the language of it all, it is murder. And there is a huge outcry going over, happening even in the UK, because it's like, how do we allow these things to continue? How do we allow these things to happen? There is a petition, there is a GoFundMe page, there is a donations page as well, um, all in support of her and her family during this time. So again, I'm gonna link everything in the description box below. Let's support, let's actually back our words with actions and making sure that we give something. I mean, even if you can't donate or whatever, it's sign the petition. Let's apply pressure. Something else that I was saying on my Insta story as well was, a, a, you know, really pushing and applying pressure on our local MPs. Our local MPs are elected by us, at least if you go out and vote, and I really, really hope that you do. Our local MPs are, uh, are, are, um, are put in that position for us. So let's even forget even the government up at the top. We are people that are in our communities that then have, then the power to take on the message further than where we might be able to get it on our own so please send emails to your local mps there's actually a website that i have again i'll link it in the description box below and i think i closed the the tab but there's actually a website you can go on and you can put your postcode in the website and you can actually find the contact details of your local mp email them call them um you know some people which again will be linked in the description box below. Um, some people put suggestions of even emailing and calling Sadiq Khan. Um, you know, he's the mayor of London, so it's his duty to make sure that he does things for the best and for the benefit of the community and the people that he's there to serve. Let's not ever forget that. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna make sure I link all of the petitions, all of the different things in the description box below. But just for the sake of time, because I know I've been going on for ages, I'm gonna also talk about the now what is seven, because I, as I was going along, I actually stopped and added more and more things that I believe will be long-term solutions in order to, to help with this. First thing that I actually put on my list was spending money more intentionally, i.e. internally. I'm gonna speak to black people for just a second. One of the things that I've kind of started realizing over time is that money literally holds power. Money holds power and it owns respect, actually. It holds both power and respect. The reason why there are so many other communities that when they experience an injustice and people hear them is because they have capital they um, are you know the business owners or they are the people that basically pump money in a system now when we look at the way we spend black people are actually some of the biggest spenders I think we are the biggest spenders on the planet um, I don't even know I don't even have time to go through the statistics or whatever but from articles I've read in the past I think that we are the, the biggest spenders but we spend a lot of it outside of the black community and um, there's like stats that I remember reading where it was like within the Jewish community money before it comes out out of their community it circulates in their community i think about five times with white people it's more than that i think it's like eight times um again please if i'm you know please don't quote me on this but um i remember and it was something like in the black community money only circulates in the black community maybe i think once or twice it was something it was something insane it was like wow we really do not spend internally now there's so many reasons for that it's not just 
oh, we don't support one another because I think there's been such a rise and especially recently an increase in black people supporting black businesses. But I think the issue is, is the fact that a lot of people are starting um, uh, now. So it might be that a lot of these other groups of people have had the years to develop infrastructures where spending has to be spent with them. For example, the, you know, the big stores, the big supermarkets, the big brands. Whereas with the black community, we don't necessarily have that. So there isn't necessarily an infrastructure that, that means that we are, even if we don't think about it, subconsciously spending with these groups of people, whereas with like white people, we are even in our subconscious spending with these people because when you need to go and buy your groceries, you go to a store that is more likely to be owned by you know a white man or whatever it is, and you spend your money there. Now, the reason why I say that this is so important, just for the long term, not just for now, but being more intentional about how we spend, is because the more we can grow, economically speaking, the more that we can um, gain power, the more that we can become stronger economically within ourselves, the more power and respect we hold, because then we have a, a, a dice, then we have a card to play. For a lot of these issues, it can almost feel like people don't hear us because we right now we don't really hold a card. Like even if, for example, all of the things that we're fighting for, all of the things that we're protesting against, etc., none of it changes, guess what? The world still keeps spinning. And we should have so much economical power, which again can only be grown over time, but we have to start somewhere, right? Can we, when you have economical power, we should be in a place whereby we have so much economical power that the world can't keep spinning without us. Even though, right, we all know that a lot of the stuff and the resources that we have does come from us. Whether it be the Colton in our phones, whether it be the diamonds, whatever, it comes from the beautiful continent that is Africa. And it's pillaged and stolen and etc. And that's a whole nother branch of the conversation about infrastructure and corruption and then infiltrating our own, you know, our own back home and all that kind of stuff. That's a whole nother conversation. But I'm just talking about where you can being more intentional with where you are spending economically because a lot of these um, big corporations that we see, they had to start from somewhere. So the more and more we support them, we know that we are investing, slowly, slowly investing by keeping them going because they all they can do is snowball effect and grow. So the more you're supporting those black businesses, one day they will become, you know, like what, right now we, we were seeing the Jay-Z's and the Tyler Perry's, etc., in America who are doing some of the things that our ancestors probably wouldn't have even dreamt of us even doing because there's been continuous support and there's been continuous support in that way. So they now have leverage. For example, Jay-Z, the whole NFL thing, again, you know, we can agree to disagree or whatever, but I actually felt like it was one of the smartest moves that anyone could make because I honestly do believe in infiltrating from within, not necessarily from just screaming from the outside, but infiltrating from within, being in there in order for you to actually stand up and say, listen, I'm gonna, not that this is what he did, but just how I see it, in order for you to be in there and say, I am going to speak from a perspective where I know that this will benefit my people. So that was the first thing. The second thing as well is understanding who we are and understanding where we come from. From. Now, I'm not going to go into a whole long, deep history lesson as to why we should do this, but you know, I, whose quote is it? There's somebody's quote, I don't know if it's Dubois, I don't know if it's um, Garvey, um, oh, I can't find it, I don't know who it was, right? But it basically speaks, I've read so many books um, by black writers and who would speak about the importance and one of the ground things that they always spoke about is the importance of us knowing who we are, understanding our roots, understanding our history again, beyond just slavery, okay? In order for you to actually know how to act accordingly. When you don't know who you are, you don't know how to act, in all honesty, because that your um, everything that you see or everything that you respond to or how reactive you are is based off of just what you're seeing in front of you, rather than actually going back, taking a step back and understanding who you are and understanding the importance of who you are the importance of the power that you hold the fact that you are kind of like my top right now powerful you can't um move forward if you don't know your history and you don't know where you come from which i think is oftentimes the real big issue with a lot of people is like you you don't even feel the need or the the, the desire or the care to support people from your community sometimes because you don't see the value of it you don't see the value of your community especially when the narrative has been skewed for so long where it's like we don't support each other, we kill each other, we do this, we do that. I mean, 
that narrative is very very like just yeah okay we've heard it now we've heard it all before yeah let's move on from that but yeah the second thing that i said is understanding who we are understanding our roots so the next thing that i have on my list and like i said to you guys before you don't have to agree with everything that i say but it is vote voting strategically not emotionally and getting into spaces that we wouldn't normally be in now for me in my personal opinion okay this is just my opinion is that we live in a society and in a world where there are certain systems and structures that are put in place many of which do have core underlying systemic and systematic issues i.e racism or prejudice right now my thing is two weeks from now and i know i keep referring back to two weeks but let's just say two weeks from now when people have gone back to living right because the only people that are going to truly be grieving for a very long time are the family members who have the direct impact the rest of us is like a trickle effect but they will have the direct impact and have to deal with that every day but other than that most people will probably go back to work especially if this lockdown lifts or whatever people will go back to school go back to work and have their own issues and problems that they have to deal with now my issue is is um when then in two weeks time people go back to doing what they do in life and now something happens i.e someone's being robbed or someone's getting beaten up or whatever it is you are going to have to call the police that is the nature of the system that you have to depend on the very system that can often be for your detriment right now that's why a lot of people call for there to be the abolition of um the the criminal justice system or or whatever it is now i don't really know where i stand with that because i think there's so many questions and it's too um too broad of a brush to just paint and just kind of say yeah let's just get rid of the criminal justice system but it's like wait a minute what does happen to the pedophiles murderers rapists etc etc that also go through this this criminal justice and, the, and this judicial system because they genuinely have done you know some of the most horrific and most dangerous things but anyway the issue is, is that we still have to call on these people. So what then happens? So then what do I think is a solution? We should be penetrating these very spaces and these very places. Why? Because that's where change really happens. Change happens from within. Now imagine there are communities that need policing because that's what that, that's what's needed. When you have human beings, it needs policing. I personally believe that we should be policing our own communities, but the way in which the infrastructure is working right now, that's not the case, right? So doesn't it make sense for more people that look like me and maybe you that's watching this or maybe not, but that look like me to be in these very systems that are policing our very communities because they might not necessarily have the same mindset or whatever, but I would sure like to believe that a lot of them may come from a place of understanding and a deeper and a more intimate level of understanding than maybe someone that does not come from a community that has our experience. So my thing is, that's how you penetrate. That's how you change things by being inside, you know, more of us being in positions of political authority and political power, whether it be being in politics in our local communities or on a national level or even an international level being at the forefront of conversations that are happening about us you know people often run away from politics like oh i don't want to get involved in politics politics literally affects every area of our lives from our judicial system to how much money certain areas get to how much money um certain kids get to the way the education system runs that's all political and if we're not writing um, sorry if we're not voting for the right people or having the, the the right people strategically not just based off of your emotion or because your friend said this person is the best person to vote for no because you've actually done your own research you actually looked at their manifestos you've actually looked at what they're saying and how they are impacting your community and we actually position people strategically in order for there to be effective change so you know while a lot of people say you know some people scream and shout f the police da -da 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 -da, whatever it is pigs whatever you want to call it my issue is okay then you might say that but those are the same people that are going to be policing your community and if something happens you're going to have to call them so what do we do it starts with us either there's there's because the, i only see it working in two ways either we police our communities ourselves which right now i don't think that we have the infrastructure to do or we ensure that there are people that look like us and that share a lived experience as us or even if it's not a lived experience but somewhat of a deeper connection and experience with us to be in those spaces just saying to people that oh you're a snake you're you're a because oftentimes what happens is people become uncle tom's or become a snake or become whatever it is calling people that 
for wanting to be in these spaces is the most counterproductive, unproductive thing I've ever heard of. Because we need people in those spaces. Because then when we don't have people that look like us in those spaces, we can't complain and then say nothing is changing. Yeah, well, people that look like us are not infiltrating these very systems and these, in these very spaces. So um, that was something else that I just put on. And again, you don't have to agree with me. Not everyone's going to agree, but that's just something that I truly do believe is a long-term solution. So if you know that you are black and you know that you have maybe an issue with the police and, and the, the police system or the judicial system, maybe you might say, do you know what? I'm going to become a lawyer, a barrister. Yes, we face more hurdles. Yes, there's the racism. Yes, sometimes you do have to be the one of or the person that takes that first step. But if you really do want to make a difference in that way and you see that, do you know what? This is an area where I could go in because I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not built to be a police officer. I couldn't do that, but I know my lane, okay? I know my lane. If you know that you want to become a lawyer, well, you better become the best, best damn black lawyer that there is, okay? Or whatever space that you know that change could be made, go in there, but go in there with intention and with strategy, knowing that you are going in there and you, do you know what? When you see something is going wrong, say something about it, do something, because then you might be the only one, you know, and that's how it starts and that's how there's a ripple effect of change. The next thing that I wrote on there, and I think I mentioned already in the video, so I'm not going to touch on it too much, but writing to your local MPs and those that you vote for. So for example, I know in my area, my local MP is Lynn Brown. She works, she is the local MP for West Ham and in the local area, she is from uh, the, the Labour Party. Um, our area in East London is very, very Labour, Labour focused. And that's who, um, that's who I know that I am going to be writing to. Literally, as soon as I finish this video, I'm sending out an email because I know if I go home, I ain't going to get it done. So I'm sending out an email to her and I applaud anybody, please, like, you know, find um, the, the, what's it called, the email, the contact details of your local MP and email them, put pressure on them. You know, they can't, they can, they can maybe ignore one or two emails, but they cannot ignore when there's a huge influx of people saying, you need to pay attention to this thing because we we voted for them. That's just how you have to see it. I gave you that permission and I voted and I voted for Lynn Brown. And I know that because of that, I have every right to expect something from you because I voted for you. I put you in that position, you know? So that's something else. The next thing that I wrote on here as well is to donate. Again, I've spoken about it across the video. Links will be in the description box below. The next thing that I said as well is get involved in the conversation. And I think this is something that's very, very important. Now, I'm not just saying the conversation, i.e. on Twitter or on, on, on Instagram. I'm not saying that. But I'm talking about getting involved in the conversation in the long term. So, you know, um, again, I think a lot of it is, a lot of this is very, very political, but that's where true, true change, and that's where the infrastructures of our society start. It's very political. So even having conversations and being a part of political conversations in your local community, in your local area, um, with your local MPs, or even MPs outside of your local community, being in the room. Because one thing that frustrates me is when people have conversations about people that look like me, black people, and we're not in the room to be able to give our two pence on issues that are affecting us directly. That gets on my nerves. It gets on my nerves that companies have the head of diversity or the head of, um, of, of, um, of black relations or whatever you want to call it. And the person that is doing that job is white. It gets on my nerves. Not that that is a bad thing that white people are getting involved in the conversation, but it gets on my nerves that we put people that are not necessarily qualified. Already the fact that you are not black is already unqualifying you in being the person that leads the conversation. If you truly want to make a difference and make a change, let the people that you are trying to help actually lead the conversation because they can speak to you from a place of experience. They can speak to you from a place of understanding. Not that all of our experiences are exactly the same, but there is a a level of understanding, a level of consciousness that goes on around the world as an individual black person. No matter how far you are from, oh, I've never had a racial issue, I've never had issues with the police, I've never had this, I've never had that. There's still an underlying um, unity and oneness because we all share something that we cannot hide. Like, you can go out, for example, I've had this conversation before where my sister got into an, an issue in school and I remember she was racially abused. Best believe I went into that school and I had to go and talk to their head teacher, was it the deputy head, and I had to check him because they didn't do anything about it. They, they literally blew it off as though it was nothing. And I had to go and speak to him and I said, listen, you are a white man. 
You could go your whole entire life being gay and guess what? You could hide that and no one would ever say anything to you. But I am a black woman. She is a young black woman, a young black woman. She cannot hide her blackness. People will tend to, I'm not saying all the time, but probably 99.9% .9 of the time, people would already make a judgment of her based off of the color of her skin because it's the first thing that people see. Forget what she has to say, forget what's going on up in there. The first thing that people see is her blackness. They see her skin color. The first thing that people see when they see me is the fact that I am a black woman. We can't hide that. So that's the one thing that there is a, a common understanding across the world that our blackness is something that we cannot hide. So yeah, I would definitely say get involved in the conversation, be at the forefront of the conversations where you can. And you know what, this is not to say that every single person needs to be at the forefront of the conversation, because I also recognize and know that sometimes people don't necessarily have the words or have the capacity or truly understand what it is that they're getting themselves into. Absolutely fine, support the people that are at the forefront of the conversations and that is enough. And then the last thing that I also wanted to say in here, which I think is so important, and I know that it's easier said than done, but we cannot live our lives with fear. So I literally wrote down, don't live in fear. Now, one thing that I have kind of been thinking about quite a lot in terms of what is the agenda behind a lot of the stuff that we see and that we are exposed to when it comes to police brutality, murder, the unlawful treatment of, of black um, black people, what is it? And one of the things that I kept thinking was, you know, yes, social media is very powerful and it's important that we see these images and we see like what happened to George Floyd was heartbreaking. I couldn't watch the whole thing, but it's important to raise awareness for it. But at the same time, could these things be pu pushed out by the by the um the media or being put at the forefront of the media because there's a bigger reason behind it is it because they want um people to continue to be re-traumatized re-traumatized over and over again is it because because one thing that i've noticed is that we see a lot of a lot of the time when black people are put in media or put on, a, on like a let's say in front of people we tend to be in a place of pain or suffering you always see like our bodies are always being mutilated whether it be 12 years a slave or slavery movies and slavery films um roots whatever you want to call it we are normally put in a position where we are experiencing pain hardship or trauma and it's like what is the agenda behind it? I, and I get that it's important for us to tell these stories so that people don't forget what has happened and people don't think like, oh yeah, you know, racism never was a thing. No, let's not do that. But I also always question like, what is the reasoning behind it? Why is it that all of a sudden when you start filming, seeing films that are like 12 years a slave and all of this stuff, they're the ones that win the Emmys and the, and the Oscars, etc. It just makes me question, like, what is it? Is it because they want to re-traumatize black people? Is it because they want to desensitize black people? Because when you put something in front of someone so long, eventually it becomes like a, oh, okay, saw that, been there, done that. Just like a lot of people who end up in even things like when you hear stories of young young guys who are in violence in like gangs and, and knife crime and all that kind of stuff in the UK, you will hear them say, you get to a point where it doesn't affect you anymore because you've watched so many of your friends die. Is that what it is? Just desensitizing people or is it one thing that i even think is more powerful than desensitizing and and re reliving trauma putting people in constant fear because i truly do believe that once you have made someone fearful you can control them when someone is afraid you have the power you can control them and that's something that i think about and i sit back and i think is this about maintaining control about making people act irrationally because of their fear, making people constantly afraid that they can't even live their life and flourish the way that they should flourish because they are constantly afraid. And that's where I then sat there and thought, where people are constantly afraid, and that is not a way to live. You can't flourish and grow from a place of fear. You can't live out your fullest potential from a place of fear. In fact, fear paralyzes, fear cripples, and fear destroys. So for me, it's just a question of, you know, yes, of course, we have every right to be afraid. I talk about it all the time, the fact that I used to be so gassed about America. Like, I always used to be like, oh my gosh, America this, America that. I can't wait. One day I'm going to go and live there. And I always had this dream of going to live in America. But I genuinely don't know the level of anxiety that I would be feeling if, obviously, you guys know that I am, um, my fiance is Ben, who is a black man, a tall, big, six foot six, 
dark skin black man the level of anxiety i would probably feel every single day when he's just driving his car and even now he drives a really nice car um driving his car knowing that they would probably think that knowing that they'll probably think that he either stole the car or he'll get stopped or whatever and him being stopped could literally lead to his death even if he didn't do anything even if he acted accordingly even if he did everything by the book it could still lead to his death. I don't know, I can't lie to you, the level of anxiety that I would have every single day, especially if I then was to have our, you know, our black sons. I want three sons, okay? I want three boys and two girls. That's my ideal. But now imagine having three boys growing up in an environment like that where you literally don't know that they could leave for school and might not come back. That is a type of fear that I don't even know how people can live with. But at the same time, I don't know how, and that's one thing I, like I said, don't know the answer to everything, but finding a way not to be, not to be limited and to live by fear, because that's how control is maintained. That's how you are controlled because you're always watching, watching your shoulder, paranoid. You're always constantly thinking about what could go wrong rather than focusing on what could go right and how great you are and how great you can be. So, you know, while it's easier said than done, I would definitely say don't live in fear because i truly do believe that that's what they want that's what they want they want you to constantly live in fear so that you can't even focus on being great you can't even focus on doing all the incredible things that you need to do because you're so focused on who's going to kill me how am i going to get hurt and i don't think that is a way to live um again easier said than done but just one of the long-term things. If we want to propel and we want to truly make a difference, we can't do it from a place of fear. So, um, yeah, just something for us to think about. But anyway, guys, I have been going on for the longest time. I don't even know how long this video is going to be. I might end up doing a part one and a part two, depending on how long this video is. Um, or I might just leave it. Even if it is really, really long, I'll just leave it up and see how people respond to it and see if people care for it. Who the hell knows? But I appreciate you guys so much for watching. Um, don't forget to like, subscribe, share this around as well. Again, like I said, I by no means am the gatekeeper. I am by no means the speaker of the entire whatever you want to call it. I am by no means somebody who has all of the solutions and all of the answers. But I am definitely a black woman who felt this in her heart and in her soul and knew that she wanted to do something. So yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you guys again in another video. Stay beautiful.